word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. And there we have at the very back of the church there, Romans 12, 1 and 2, present your bodies a living sacrifice and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may become a manifestation of divine will. And that's what eating the flesh and drinking the blood is all about. The intake of Bible doctrine, that you take the word of God into you and be transformed by it, thereby we are saved. Amen? Amen. Thank you, Camille. Uh, we did not take up an offering. You all know that there's a uh, chest at the back of the church that you can put an offering in as you leave. Amen? So now it's time for my message. Uh, Ron, did you have anything? Oh, you, yeah, you just gave it. Silly me. It's just that we're so mixed up today, aren't we? Okay. This is a message that I like to give on this particular celebration, which is Jesus' triumphal exit. He left, but it was in triumph. Preachers sought to find out acceptable words, and that which was written was upright, even words of truth. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in the sight of the Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Mark 8, verses 27 to 31. Now Jesus and his disciples went out to the towns of Caesarea, Philippi, and on the road he asked his disciples, saying to them, Who do men say I am? So they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered and said to him, You are the Christ. Then he strictly warned them that they should tell no one about him. He began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and to be killed and after three days to rise again. The Passover week can be divided into three distinct parts, his entry, his exit, and his resurrection. We had a close look at Christ's triumphal entry into Zion and what it all means beyond the historical and the academic. We did that a couple of weeks ago. And I showed how the 10th day of Nisan, the day of the purchase of the lamb, fell on Saturday that year, so it was moved to Sunday, the 11th day, by the authorities. And while the people could not purchase their Passover lambs because it was a Sabbath, Jesus entered Jerusalem as the true Passover lamb of God. And today we continue with a closer look at his exit, also known as his passion. And all those things in the event that transcends time and space. And I hope to show how it all relates to us even to this very day. We pick up the events on Tuesday of that week as Jesus returned from Bethany and began to teach at the temple. So we'll go to Matthew 21, verses 23 to 27, and then to 28. Now when he came into the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people confronted him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things? And who gave you this authority? And Jesus answered them and said, to them, I also ask you one thing, which if you tell me, I likewise will tell you by what authorities I, I do these things. The baptism of John, where was it from? From heaven or from men? And they reasoned among themselves, saying, 
If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did we, you not believe him? But if we say from men, we fear the multitude, for all count John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus and said, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. After this, he taught in parables. And then in Matthew 23, he warned the scribes and the Pharisees of their abuse of authority. Going on to 27 and 28. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which indeed appear fruitful outwardly, but inside are full of dead men's bones and all unclean, uncleanness. Even so, you also outwardly appear righteous to men, but inside you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. You know, that's been a mark of authority from the very beginning. There's good authority. Good authority comes from God, but there is abusive authority, abusive authority also, and that is invariably hypocritical. We have such hypocrisy in government. Amen? Let it not be in the body of Christ, however. Then in Matthew 24, verse 2, Jesus predicts the destruction of the temple and the signs of the end of the age with his return. We've been pretty focused on the ends of the age, signs of the ends of the age. A lot of people, particularly today, because it seems like it's very, very close. But I want to keep telling people, take your mind off worrying about the end of the age. It's going to come. What we should be concerned about is are we conforming to the image of the sun? That's what we need to conform to. That's what we need to focus on, not the end of the age. People have been saying the end is near for centuries now. Looking at plagues, and, and we got one right now, but this is only one of many earthquakes in various places, all this stuff. All this stuff's been happening. Now, it might be accelerating today, but it's still nothing new. Amen? And we don't know how much time each one of us have, you know? And if we're looking for a historical rapture, we may not be around to receive it. But the point is that we each have a rendezvous with Christ. We each have a personal rapture that's going to be our, only ours and nobody else's. Amen? And it's just as important as it is as any other rapture. Amen? So Jesus told what was going to happen during, in the time of his return. And people have been watching for it ever since. Jesus just says, be ready. That's all. He just says, be ready. One of the problems I have with focusing on end times prophecies is that sometimes I wonder if people are not looking for loopholes. You know, I can... I can, don't have to worry too much until just about before it happens, and then I can repent of everything. Well, Now, all of this is happening. While it's happening, the rulers were plotting to kill Jesus. In Matthew 26, verses 3 to 5, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people assembled at the palace of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas, and plotted to take Jesus by trickery and to kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest there be an uproar among the people. Well, they did it anyway. Well, the next day, Tuesday, appears to be the day that Jesus and his disciples made preparation for their Passover Seder, that being the 14th day of, after the true day, that is the the uh, true day of purchase was the 14th, uh, the 10th day of uh, uh, Nisan, uh, after the first new moon of spring, according to, I think it was Genesis chapter, no, it was Exodus chapter 12, I believe, where uh, Moses was told that this would be the beginning of the sacred year. So 10 days after the first new moon of spring, uh, the lambs were to be purchased and killed uh, on the 14th day. 
But the tenth day that year, that particular year, fell on a Saturday. I mentioned all this last time, so I don't want to go over it too much right now. Just to say that Jesus was the real Passover lamb. He came in on a Saturday, not a Sunday. The authorities moved it to Sunday because they couldn't purchase on a Saturday. So while Israel was purchasing lambs on Sunday, they'd already had the Lamb of God come in the day before. Four days later, the 14th day, the Lamb was to be killed and then eaten by the people at sunset on the 14th day. Well, that happened to be Wednesday according to the... um, the real calendar, not the one that the authorities had adjusted in order to enable the people to buy the lambs. I hope you're following me so far. So the preparation is made on that Wednesday by Jesus and his disciples. It says in Matthew 26, verses 17 to 20, Now on the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying to him, where do you want us to prepare you for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. So the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and they prepared the Passover. When evening had come, he sat down with the twelve. So this is on the Wednesday. If he comes in on a Saturday, you count four days, and the day starts at sunset the previous day. So Friday, sunset, was the first day. Well, actually, it was the, ten- the tenth day, the day of purchase. So you go Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, becomes the 14th day. So Wednesday afternoon is when uh, the, the people would have been killing lambs, but they put it to the next day uh, because of the change by the authorities. So Jesus and his disciples sit down to observe the real Passover on Wednesday. The rest of the nation is going to kill those lambs at 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Thursday, which is the time Jesus died. Amen? Amen. So at evening, Jesus and his disciples celebrated the real Passover Seder on the 14th day of Nisan, while the rest of Israel waited until the 15th day because of the adjustment made by the authorities that particular year. John 13, verse 1 says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, Having loved his own much, uh, his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. There is something that I would like to say about this place where Jesus instituted his last supper. It was held in an upper room. See Mark fourteen fifteen to seventy says, "Then I will show you a large upper room, furnished and prepared. There make ready for us." So. His disciples went out and came into the city and found it just as he had said it to them. And they prepared the Passover. In the evening, he came with the twelve. The Hebrew word for upper room is alaya. It is a compound word that I believe literally means to ascend to the self-existent one. Alai means to rise up or to ascend. And ya means the self-existent one. So, to ascend to the self-existent one. Now, in the Greek, it's anagion. Anagion ana means to, to ascend or rise, and gion is talking about the earth, to arise from the earth or to be above the earth. So, in both cases, whether it's Hebrew or Greek, it's talking about being above the earth, all right? But in the, in the Hebrew, I think it's even better where it says, to arise to the self-existent one. Um, What I find very, very interesting right now is that for several years now, the Jews have been returning to to Israel. You know about that? Jewish people from all over the world have been returning to Israel, and you know what they call that? They call it the Aliyah. Now, 
I don't know if they know what they're doing here. You know, it's their language, it's not mine. But I tell you what, it's pretty interesting. If they really do believe that it's returning to the self-existent one, you don't do that by going to a place in the world. You follow me? You don't do that unless you want to say that Israel is my God. Not unless you say that the, the, state, the nation of Israel is God. No, it is not God. You know, and I, I hope you understand what I'm saying here. So it's very interesting to me that they are actually calling that move back to Israel the Eliah. They ought to know what that means. I would, I would think they'd know that what that means. So if they do know what that means, surely it's, they've got to wonder, wait a minute, are we going back to God? Yeah. Or rising to God by going back to Israel? Going back to Israel is not the way to rise to God. We, we know that, right? The way to rise to God is to present yourself a living sacrifice and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the intake of Bible doctrine, by accepting Jesus as the only way, the only truth, and the only life. He is the Elijah. He is the way to rise to the mighty one. Anyway, at some time during the Seder, Jesus revealed Judas as his betrayer and told him to leave and fulfill his purpose. It's in Matthew 26, verses 14 to 16. It tells us, Then one of the twelve, named Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, What are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? And they counted out to him 30 pieces of silver. So from that time, he sought opportunity to, be, to betray him. He looked for ways to betray Jesus from the time he got his 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver. It's not a very pr high price, is it? I mean, Jesus is worth a whole lot more than that. But you know what? We're not. And that's what Jesus was representing. He was representing us. We were slaves, right? 30 pieces of silver is the price of a slave. After the Seder, that is after the supper, the last supper, Jesus and his disciples left and went to the garden called Gethsemane, where he asked the Father to deliver, deliver him from his appointed task. That was in his humanity. Jesus was in hypostatic union. That means he was fully man and fully God at the same time. Now, I have heard recently, and I've heard it in the past too, that Jesus did not have the Holy Spirit until he got baptized by John in the Jordan River. And today, that I say, poppycock. John the Baptist, if you look in the book of Luke, I think it's the first chapter, I can't remember exactly where in Luke, where John is named, it actually tells us that John was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception. And if John was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception, then by golly, my Lord Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit from conception. Amen? This is nonsense that, oh, he was only a man until he was baptized in the Jordan River. No, no, no. He was in hypostatic union from the very, very beginning. When he got baptized in the Jordan River by John, John said, surely you should be baptizing me. And he said, no, let this be done to fulfill all righteousness. And what happened was the witnesses said that the Holy Spirit ascended descended on him as a dove. Now, people misunderstand and think that he didn't have it before that. No, no, no. Just the same as at the tomb of Lazarus. When Jesus spoke, he said, I say this for the benefit of the hearers only, Lord. Amen? And that appearance of the Spirit, in the, in the, not in the form of a dove, but descending gently like a dove would, that that was for the benefit of the witnesses. That was not an indication 
that Jesus did not have the Holy Spirit until that time. I hope I make myself clear. And I, you know, <laughs> people are going to disagree with me, and they're welcome to do that. But again, I say, if John the Baptist had the Spirit from conception, then why wouldn't Jesus? Amen? Amen. People, I don't know, people make silly things like this. And they, the, the problem is they don't check it out. They see one thing, pull it out of context, and they don't. If you, go, if you don't get agreement throughout the scriptures, then toss it aside, folks. Matthew 26, 39 says, He went a little further, fell, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, O oh, oh my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Now, this to me, to me, okay, just to me, this is where it was fulfilled. Didn't have to wait for the cross. It was fulfilled here. But he had to show that he had the conviction. What's, what's the word of it? Um, uh, I can't remember the saying. That he, he proved his conviction by going to the cross. The courage of his conviction. That's what I'm saying. The cross was the courage of his conviction. His conviction was already made in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane actually means the treading of the grapes. You know, um, that's the, the place where uh, the wine is made, actually. So uh, he's, he, he says, not my will. I am terrified. He was so scared, so f afraid that in his humanity that he was bleeding uh, from his pores. It's called hematidrosis. It's a known condition, and it occurs with extreme terror. He, he knew exactly what he was headed for. He knew it. And he was terrified in his humanity. Now remember, in order for him to go through this, it's what the, what's called the kenosis. His, uh, his deity left him. He was left in his humanity. And this is why on the cross he said, why have you forsaken me? Right? Because Jesus had to be tempted in his humanity, not in his deity. Amen? So he was there uh, under tremendous pressure with extreme fear. His deity had left him. He was there naked in his humanity and in terror, bleeding from his pores in, from, from extreme terror. But he said, Lord, not my will but yours be done. Period. Wow. Wow. It was done right then and there. It was done. It was done. So then he goes to the cross. Now, Judas arrived with the temple garden while Jesus was there in the garden. And Jesus got arrested. It says in John 18, verses 3 to 6, Now Judas, then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, and officers, priests and the Pharisees, came with, there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. I want to stop here for a second. Now look, we see this too often. And people might say, well, you know, what are you making a deal out of this for? I have a good reason. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops, that is not necessarily what it says. Because the word for detachment of troops is spaira and it actually can easily be translated <laughs> a squad of, of Levitical janitors a squad of Levitical janitors yeah and then it says and officers and that's officers can also mean servants from the high priest and the Pharisees now we know and we can tell from the other the other records that uh, there were officers from the temple, not from not from uh, not from the uh, Romans, but officers from the temple. 
priests and servants from the temple that went to arrest Jesus. There is no indication, as far as I'm concerned, except in the tra traditional understanding, in reality, there were no Roman soldiers involved in the arrest of Jesus. The Romans didn't even get involved until after he saw Pilate, you know? Think about this for a minute. You know, the, the, it was temple guards. It was the Jews that arrested Jesus. It was not the Romans that arrested Jesus. It was Jews that arrested Jesus. And it was the authorities. Now, you know, I'm not saying all Jews because there were a lot of Jewish believers, by golly. There were. But the authorities wanted to get rid of this guy, Jesus. So they sent... Uh, a squad of Levitical janitors, I, I think that's funny as can be, a squad of Levitical, Levitical janitors and servants of the chief priests and Pharisees. And they came with lanterns and torches to, and, and with weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now, when he said to them, I am he, I am, the he is, I think, uh, assumed. I think he just said, I am. Oh, wow. Now, the Romans would not have known what that meant, but the Jews sure did, right? And that's why they drew back and fell to the ground, and again, another indication, it was not Roman soldiers. It was Jewish temple gods. Amen. When Judas realized what he had done, he, could, he tried to return his blood money, but found that he could not vindicate himself. Matthew 27, verse fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the value of him, who was priced, whom they of the children of Israel priced and gave them for the potter's field as the Lord directed me. The potter's field, why? This incident is a glorious presentation of God's purpose in coming to earth in the form of man and taking the curse of Adam into himself so that by his death he would defeat death and restore the sons of Adam to himself. See, pottery is not biodegradable. You can't just get rid of it. And so it needed a place for the broken, worthless pieces to be discarded because they're going to be around a long time. Archaeologists are finding pieces of pottery that are thousands of years old, same as they were the day they were, they were, the way they were made. Now, that place was known as the potter's field, a place that was separated from valuable land. When you got all this non-biodegradable uh, clay sitting there on the land, the land becomes worthless. You can't do anything with it. It was set aside for those things that are worthless. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Here we see a picture of fallen man broken and worthless and without hope. But that discarded place was purchased by the 30 pieces of silver. We were purchased. And the blood of Jesus was imputed to us, giving us great value. Without it, we're just broken pieces of pottery. With it, we are of tremendous value. Value beyond our understanding. So, the scriptures tell us that it is called the field of blood, his blood to this day. I think that it gives new meaning to Jeremiah 29, 11 that says, I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. The Lamb of God was tried at night by both high priests. There were two high priests that year. And that was illegal 
to try him by night was illegal. Then he was tried by the Sanhedrin, again, illegally, by night. Then he was taken to Pilate, who tried to free Jesus by invoking a Jewish tradition that a pre the prisoner could be released during the Passover. Pilate knew that, and Pilate didn't want, did not want Jesus' death on his hands. And it's not just that he didn't want his death on his hands. This wasn't a selfish thing. He really believed Jesus was who he said he was. The, the Acts of Pilate is, is available. It has been found. And uh, this was a report that Pilate sent back to Tiberius Caesar concerning the arrest and crucifixion of Jesus Christ, where he actually says that he believed that Jesus was, in fact, who he said he was. And he did everything he could to keep this thing from happening. But as Jesus said when he appeared to Pilate in the report that Pilate made, he said, you can't stop it, Pilate, because it's going to happen. It has to happen. And Pilate said, I'll, 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 I'll free you. He said, you can't do that. It's going to happen. It has to happen. So in John 18, 39, Pilate said, but you have a custom that I should release somebody or someone to you at the Passover. Do you therefore want me to release to you the king of the Jews? Then they all cried out saying, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. He was more than a robber. He was a, he was a murderer too. Now his, this is interesting to me. In the Nestle translation of the scriptures, it says that his name was Jesus Barabbas. Isn't that interesting? Jesus Barabbas. Now I don't know because the Nestle translation is one of the one of the uh, newer ones. It's one that uh, is more liberal than the others. Uh, so I don't know, but it's in in interesting because it fits anyway. Because Barabbas actually means the son of the father. Bar Abba, Bar Abba, Ba is son, Abba is father. So Barabbas actually means son of the father. And if it was Jesus Barabbas, that's even more interesting. So I hope you can see the irony in the substitution of Jesus of Nazareth for the murderer Barabbas and its significance for all of us. You see, Jesus was condemned in our place. Do you see it? It's interesting. They're all calling out, free Barabbas, free Barabbas. What they're calling out is, free the son of the father, free the son of the father. And it's a murderer that they're releasing. Wonderful. See, this is why I say, this whole thing is orchestrated by God. It's against all odds. Jesus is, a, is our substitute. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteous, righteousness of God in him. Here again is another example of the divine orchestration of the passion of the Christ. Jesus was given over to be executed as a common criminal in our place. And where? on a Roman cross, again showing the divine hand in guiding the events. As a Jew charged with heresy, Jesus would be expected to be to receive death by stoning, not by hanging on a Roman cross. Why? To fulfill the prophecies. Because, oh, that's just one thing. <laughs> there's, a, there's more to it, but uh, just this part here. In, and you don't have to go there, but I just remember, if you want to uh, listen to the sermon again and che check me out in Psalm 22, Joshua 3.16, 2 Kings, 7, 1 to, uh, 2 Kings 6, 1 to 7, and Zechariah 12.10, are just a few of the places that predicted that the Messiah would be hung on a cross. How? How did they predict that he would be hung on a cross? 
because they were obviously talking about somebody who was killed by piercing. They all refer, for, they all refer prophetically to piercing, which is pointing to death by crucifixion. Jesus was pierced in his hands, in his feet, in his side, and in his head. Amen? Now, when we look, I'll just take one, just one. Second uh, Kings chapter 6, verses 1 to 7. Short, just a short little section there, talking about an axe head that fell into the Jordan River and floated. The axe head represents Jesus. The Jordan River represents the fall. And if you look at the Hebrew, you see that that's exactly what it's saying. And the axe head floated when a branch or a tree was thrown into the water after the axe head fell into the water. So the axe head is the pierced one, and the word axe head actually is in the Hebrew bazel, and bazel actually means to pierce, as in an axe head pierces wood. All right? You getting it? It's pretty obvious. So the pierced one falls into the fall. The water is the fall. The Jordan means to fall or descend. All right? So the pierced one is in the fall, and a tree is thrown in. What's that? The cross. Who is hung on a tree, right? The tree is thrown into the fall, and that's the application of the cross, and that's the piercing of Jesus. And what's it say? It floated? No, that's not what the Hebrew says. What the Hebrew says is the piercing overcame the fall. But that's just one. There are other places. Psalm 22 is a, a psalm uh, predicting the crucifixion of Christ and talking about piercing. Uh, when in Zechariah it says that they will look on the one who was pierced, that they pierced. So whenever you see the word pierced in the Old Testament, you can be pretty darn sure that it's talking prophetically about the crucifixion of Jesus. The one who by rights should have been stoned, but instead hangs on a Roman cross. But there's more to it than that. Plus remember that in Acts 5.30 and Galatians 3.13, it says that he's hung on a tree. Why is it called a tree? Hmm? So, but that's for another sermon. The tree, that's another sermon. Jesus suffered terribly at the hands of the authorities. But the message is not about his suffering. Too much about his suffering. Yeah, he suffered. A lot of people have suffered. But nobody brought the victory that he brought. And that's what our fo focus should be on. The victory, not the suffering, but his victory. Proving who he is. At nine o'clock that Thursday morning, Jesus was nailed to a cross. And soldiers cast lots for his clothes, as was prophesied. He was pierced in his hand, sorry, in his head by a crown of thorns. He was pierced in his hands and his feet by nails. And he was pierced in his side by a spear. At 3 p.m., as the lambs were being killed in the temple, the real Passover lamb cried out in John 19, verse 30, It is finished, and bowing his head, he gave up his ghost. As Jesus the man, the God-man, he could only be in one place at a time, but as Jesus, the Holy Spirit, he is everywhere at the same time. Amen. And that's what it means. He gave up his spirit. He gave it up so that we would receive it. And the veil of the temple that separated the holy place from the holy of holies was ripped from top to bottom. Matthew 27 Verse 51 says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split, and the dead were seen coming out of their graves. 
You know, the record has it that there was earthquake at the time. In Matthew 27, verse 52, it says the graves were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. This is a very mysterious passage to me. And I, I have looked and looked. I've tried to figure out what that means. I have no idea. But there it is. It's in the scriptures. What are you going to do? You've got to accept it. And the Roman detail that nailed Jesus to the cross was struck with fear as they realized who it was that they had just crucified. Can you imagine? Matthew 27, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and the things that had have happened, they feared greatly, greatly saying, Truly this was the Son of God. They believe that Jesus is the Son of God because of the signs and the wonders. But what about you and me? Do we need signs and wonders? How many of us look for signs and wonders in order to believe? In John 20, verse 29, Jesus said to Thomas, the doubter, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. As powerful and persuasive as signs and miracles can be, they lack the authority and endurance that is only found in the word of God. You know that the children of Israel witnessed many miracles and forgot them soon after. Look, a month after they crossed on dry ground, crossed the, dead, the Red Sea, one month after they were dancing around a golden calf. Memory is short, you know. Until you have that new mind that God promises all those who will ask for it, until then, your memory is very short and fixated on your circumstances. Amen? Driven by your circumstances. But the word of God penetrates the soul and leaves its indelible mark. And the true believer can look beyond the passion of our Lord and the marvels at and and the true believer can marvel at the symphony of redemption that was won by the most remarkable and wonderful man in all of history. That's Jesus, the most remarkable and wonderful man who ever lived. Jesus, the Christ, fully God and fully man. And I finish with this. Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 19, declares to all of creation that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether dominions or whether the thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were, create, were created through him, and all things were created for him. I've told you in the first verse of the Bible, you see, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, Barashit, God, Elohim, created bara. That word bara actually means the son of the father. And it's talking about creating something from nothing, which man cannot do. We can fashion what, from what already exists, but we can't create something from nothing. And the earth and everything in the earth was created from nothing. God created them. How did he do it? Bara. To create something in nothing means the Son of the Father. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus is the creator. And it says right here in the New Testament to go along with what it says or declares in the first verse of the Bible in the Hebrew. It says the same thing. It says, for him, for by him, 
all things were created. By Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on the earth, visible and invisible. And he is before all things. He is pre preeminent. And in him, all things hold together. All things consist. Everything it holds together through Christ Jesus. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. Oh, Lord, we need him as preeminent. We need not have our happiness as preeminent. We need not have our destiny in heaven as preeminent. We need Jesus to be preeminent. He needs to be the most important thing in your life. He needs to be what gives you hope. He needs to be what you, you look toward. He is the light at the end of the tunnel. He is the all in all. He is my model. He is the one I aspire to. He is the head of the body of the church who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence for it to please the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. All of it. Not part of it. All of it. Every bit of it. If you want to see the Father, you've got to look at the Son because there's no other place you're going to see the Father. He is the reflection of the creator of all things. Jesus died on a cross. What's a cross? The cross is the Tav, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. It's the end. It's the end. The end of what? The end of the promise, the promise that was made back in the garden in Eden that God would resolve the dilemma that man faces because of the intervention of the serpent. He is the signature the cross is the signature at the end of the, of the covenant. The signature at the end of the covenant, the cross, is the death of the flesh. Jesus is the flesh, the death of the flesh. There must be a death before there can be a rebirth. There must be a death before there can be a resurrection. Jesus did that literally. We do that spiritually. When the natural man is put to death, when our carnal nature is subjected to submission, where we submit to the authority of God found in God's Holy Spirit, that's when it is finished. Amen?